Well, hey guys, thanks for being here. It's a great day for us to be together. However you're watching, gethope.tv, our Hope at Home group out in Anger. Let's worship together. the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison door. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. No, we shout Put our hands together. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, house of the Lord, sing. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Who said, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. about Easter? That we go on Easter egg hunts. I like to do Easter egg hunts and I'm kind of scared of hugging the Easter egg. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Um, I try Easter to catch bunny. the Easter bunny. You try to catch the Easter bunny? I have something for you. Can you open it up? <gasps> what is that? An invite. An invite. It's an invitation to go to Easter at Hope. I would invite someone who means much to me. Penelope Ray because I love her so much and she's my best friend. Lucy and Ew. 
Allison. Bootsy and Allison? Um, Bella. All right, well, let's go invite her. Can you write his name in the section that says two? Yes, ma'am. Can you put it back in the egg? All right. Hey, guys. Easter Hi. Bunny. No. You wanna go come to Easter Bunny with me? Yes. Hey, Layla, I was wondering if you wanted to come to Easter with us at my church. Sure. Doopa, doopa, doopa. And we're finished. Bye-bye. Have fun inviting somebody. Well, hey, church, Matt Curtis here, one of the pastors at Hope Community Church, and it is a great day for us to be together, and those are some extremely cute kids. Uh, confession here, the one who's afraid of the Easter Bunny, that's mine. Uh, he's one of ours, but I will say this, justifiably so, he's scared of the Easter Bunny because just last year, my wife dressed up as the Easter Bunny and terrified all of us. Uh, our house is fun, for sure. Uh, but look, Easter is right around the corner, and we want to make sure that you're aware of the services that we have available at all of our campuses, all five of our campuses. That's right. We've got services at Northwest Cary, in Garner, Apex, uh, <laughs> Raleigh, and also in Fuquay. We're super excited about that. You can go to gethope.net slash Easter to reserve a seat for Easter, reserve a seat for a neighbor or coworker you want to invite into that. Also at that website, we have a digital invitation you can send to people online or through text. So we're super excited to see you at Easter. If gethope.tv is your normal campus, uh, we, we are going to be here. If you're out of town, we're going to be here right here at gethope.tv. But if not, we'd love to see you in person at one of those services. Uh, well, look, we're going to continue on in our rhythm series that we've been talking about last week. We talked about listening to God, listening to the people around us. Before that, it was rest. And today, Chase is going to continue that series as we talk about our rhythms. Uh, before we do that, we serve a good God who loves us. And whatever the noise is, whatever the distractions are in our life, let's come together. Let's stand up wherever you are. Grocery store, it's okay to stand up out of your bed, maybe even, and worship the God who is good, who loves us. Let's do it. Of the goodness of God. 
Church, will you pray with me? Father, uh, we love you. We come to you as your people, and you are God. Um, God, we know that every story matters and every person matters. Uh, and Lord, you inject yourself into our stories and into our lives. I pray that we would be a people that respond to your story of grace and mercy and kindness and chasing after us to bring redemption. Lord, we pray that we would be a church uh, that can quiet the noise and hear from you today, that our faith would grow and our trust would grow, that you are a God who loves us, who sees us, who seeks us. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name and say, amen. Growing up in Texas, barbecue is a food group, so I was always eating it constantly. I started grilling with my father when I was about 13 years old and I got really big into it. I've always found joy behind a barbecue pit. When I started diving into competition barbecue, when I started getting into the winner's circle, and I held that trophy finally, thinking that my craft is to fulfill myself. I didn't find the fulfillment I thought I would when I would hold that trophy. I really felt that maybe barbecue is not my path. Maybe I'm just supposed to get a normal job. Maybe I'm just supposed to live a normal life. I worked at a restaurant here in Raleigh for a little bit, you know, kind of standing away from barbecue. And I started to work alongside a young gentleman. And during that time, I saw something different in him that I didn't have. I started to connect with him more, not because he did things the right way, not because he was a great example, because he had joy and truly showed that joy to me each and every day. And through that relationship, he started to share a little bit about Jesus with me. He was asking me questions that had me look at my sin, which I've never done before. I think the most important thing that I realized when I came to know the Lord was my only job in life is to find souls. That is all. I don't have an evangelistic gift. I found someone who was good at evangelism. I found a seminary student who knew a lot about sermon creation. And we sat down and we made it a priority. This is what I do for a living. This is what I do every day. Where in this space can I build the kingdom? I realized that this has to be for him. He's given me everything I already need. This has to be for him. The evangelistic tour at Prime Barbecue came up. Uh, it was an idea, basically, when I started to design the place. I can teach and talk about my story and how Christ took me from death to life. And people can see that transition as I take them through the room and I use the fire as an analogy for how Jesus puts a, a log in every single day, little by little, that scripture building in our heart. And at the end of the tour, I ask them a simple question. What does your tour look like? Where do you work? Oh, I work at a gym. Okay. Tell me how you build in your day a tour to have people know about Jesus. I truly feel evangelism isn't meant to be done 
specifically in the church. It's done with your family and your children. It's done with how you love your wife, how you're friends with your friends, but most importantly, how you engage with people at work. Specifically and strategically finding their hearts and always wanting to bring them to know Christ. I love that video. Uh, I really like brisket, so that probably helps out. But uh, he's doing exactly what this series is all about. Chris is taking the things that he does every single day on a daily basis, and he's using those things with gospel intentionality to tell the story of Jesus. And that's actually how Chris became a Christ follower as well. Did you hear it? How he always thought that his, his goal in life was to just hold that trophy to be a championship barbecuer. And he thought that that would give him ultimate satisfaction and joy. But when he held it, it didn't feel like he thought it would feel. He was still missing something. But even though he was far from God, he was close to someone, a Christian friend who was close to God, who did have joy, who, who had found that thing that Chris was after. And if you listen real closely to that story, it says that, that his friend uh, started to speak to him about Jesus and started to ask him questions, question after question after question, where he came face to face with his sin and turned from that pursuit of championship barbecue and then started running towards Jesus. And his life has never been the same since. It's, it's really amazing because that's kind of my, my sermon in a nutshell this week. Uh, because today we're going to be talking about the rhythm of stories. All this is going to make sense in a few minutes. It won't right now. But the rhythm of stories, of listening to stories, telling ourselves stories, and telling other people stories. And you might not think that you have a regular rhythm of telling people stories, but you'd be wrong. Uh, we actually, as human beings, live by stories. We tell ourselves stories every single day. Stories are the things that we use to help us make sense out of life. Every single person that you know is living based on a larger story that they've told themselves, that they've bought into, that they think makes sense of their lives. If you ever want to know why someone did something or acted some way, it can always be traced back to the story that they have found themselves in. Why did that person badmouth you behind your back to your boss? Well, it's because this, in the story that they believe, um, a promotion or applause or money is the ultimate thing. If they could just have that, then they'd be fully satisfied, then they'd be content. And so they're willing to push you aside in their quest to get that thing. Or why does this person struggle with addiction and this person doesn't? Well, because it's in their story that maybe their marriage fell apart or maybe their career took a nosedive or maybe there's just some shame and guilt of the past. And they use those chemicals as a buffer. They use that to forget, they use it to numb. They use it to forget what they think is that they'll never able to be able to taste that, that joy and satisfaction that they were created for. And I could go on and on and on. But the underlying problem in all those situations, it's not the behavior. It's not the action. It's that they have believed in a false story. They've started to believe a lie, really. And that belief in the untrue story has ultimately led to heartache and confusion and frustration and sin, and tons of other things. And that's the people, that's us in this room, that's the people that we're in contact with every single day, deeply struggling in this one area of their life, and they have no idea why they can't quite seem to put their finger on it, they can't quite seem to fix themselves, when the truth is it's because they've bought into a false story. And listen, I firmly believe that God wants to use you just like he used Chris's friend and just like he's using Chris right now. God wants to use you in the lives of the people that you work with and that you maybe you room with and maybe you go to school with where you live, learn, work and play. God wants to use you to slowly and patiently and lovingly open their eyes to a better story, to a true story, to really the, the only truly true story there is, to God's story. And that's what I'm hopefully going to try to do my best to train each and every one of us to do here today. And uh, this could be kind of out of the ordinary, but I just feel the spirit like present. And uh, I think God wants to do something big. So would you mind if I prayed for a second? Let me just pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to come together across all of our campuses, um, joining in online. Father, I believe that your word wants to speak powerfully to our hearts right now. So spirit, you are welcome here. Would you invade this place? Would you invade online and all of our campuses? 
Father, if I say anything that is not in accordance with your word, will it fall to the ground and be forgotten forever? But as I lift up your word and lift up Jesus, Father, would you do something profound in our midst? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The problem of buying into false stories, I don't want you to think that it's a them problem, that it's uh, people outside the church door struggle with this. It's really an us problem. Every single person struggles with this, Christ followers included. And the reason is, is because this is a human problem. I would say this is the human problem, and it shows up on page two of our Bibles, and it never goes away. So if you have a copy of God's Word, go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, and then we're also going to be in Romans chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, if you're watching online, it'll be on the side screens as well. Uh, But when we pick it up in Genesis chapter 3, we're jumping after some really important events happen, right? God has created the universe in seven days. He's hung the stars in the sky. He's created the earth and all the animals and all the plants. And he's handcrafted this little area of the earth specifically for the pinnacle of his creation, Adam and Eve. And so he's, he's taken note of all their needs and all their longings and all their desires. And he's made sure that he can meet them all in this little garden that we call Eden. And he's lovingly placed Adam and Eve in that garden. Isn't that an amazing existence? Living in absolute perfection where you can just enjoy God and enjoy one another and enjoy his creation, right? Well, that, that, that state of perfection, it doesn't last very long. And they actually lose it in chapter 3. And so what I want to ask today is why in the world did Adam and Eve throw all of that away? What caused them to lose their grip on perfection? And the reason, as you'll see, is because they bought into a lie. Because they traded a true story for a false story. And that's what causes all the brokenness we see. Look at verse 1. It says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? How cruel of a God would that be? Look at all these awesome fruits. Nope, you have to starve. No, of course, God did not say that, okay? But what the serpent is doing is he's providing Eve a separate story. He's saying, God's been telling you this story all along. I want to start providing you another one. And what he's really doing is he's calling into question um, uh, God's goodness, right? Look at what Eve says. She knows better. She says, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. This is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She says, no, God's good. God loves us. God wants us to be safe and satisfied. He's made all of this, all the creation and this garden so that we can enjoy. But there's just one little thing that we can't do. Just that one tree. We can't eat from that one tree. And look at the serpent. He says, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. It's just lie after lie. He said, God is not the God that you think he is. He's holding out on you. He's told you one thing, but he can't be trusted. In fact, there's more joy and there's more satisfaction than you could ever dream of. God's just keeping you from it. And the key is you don't need to rely on God. You need to turn your back on him and walk away from him. That joy that you've been created for, that satisfaction you're after, that wisdom, that's found being independent from God. It's called the the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because when a Hebrew child approached like their late teen years and they were ready to strike out on their own and get a job and start a family, they were said to be of the age where they knew good from evil. They were ready to be independent. So Satan's saying, the serpent's saying, you need to be independent from God. And so Satan takes this completely different story than the story that Adam and Eve have heard from God and he just sets it on the table and he waits to see how Eve responds. And it's here at the beginning of verse 6, not the end, but the very beginning of verse 6, that perfection is lost, that the fall actually occurs. Look at it. Verse 6, the woman was convinced. Eve threw away God's story and believed the serpent. She traded the truth for a lie. And because she believed that, what you'll see is this process. Her, her emotions and then her actions follow. Look at verse, uh, the second part of verse 6. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. See, belief gives way to desire. Once we believe something is good, we begin to yearn for it and long for it. And then comes our actions. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. But see, the eating, the sinful act, that wasn't the start of the fall. That was the end of the fall. 
the fall, the loss of perfection, that the cause of all the brokenness and pain that we have in our world is because they were convinced. They were convinced that God really couldn't be trusted, that he wasn't as great as he said he was, that he was holding out on them, that joy and satisfaction could be found apart from God. And so they took the fruit and they acted, they ate. But the results were the exact opposite of what the serpent said would happen. Look at verse 7. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So they eat, and in that moment, I don't mean this to be crude, but they look down and they look at each other. They're like, we're not gods. God can create life just by speaking a word. Looks like we can only procreate. We can't create. This is, this is not what the serpent said would happen. We're no different than we were before. And they realized that what the serpent told them was a lie, but there's no going back. The damage is done. Now that, they ha- now that they've chosen to strike out on their own without God, they begin this desperate quest to kind of cover over their nakedness, cover up their shame, and really fulfill themselves or satisfy themselves or provide themselves with the joy and contentment that they were created for. See, it's belief in a lie that leads to desire that leads to sin. And what happened with Adam and Eve is what happened with every single human being from that time on. And you have to get this. I'm trying to, uh, this is like a how to be a missionary 101 class, okay? This is how missionaries are taught to think and like seminary and stuff. And if you can just begin to see this, you're going to see it everywhere. In Romans 1, Paul describes the exact same process that Adam and Eve went through happening in my life and happening in your life, happening in every single human being's life. Look at what he says in Romans 1.19. It says, they, which is humanity, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. Paul says, just like Adam and Eve, every human being knows that there's a God. He says, just look around. Look at the sky and the weather patterns and the animals and all the human beings and the intricacy and the DNA and this beautiful, amazing creation. Every single person knows deep down there has to be a creator. This can't just happen by chance. But see, we inherited that that, that rebellious spirit from Adam and Eve. We like to strike out on our own. And so if we admit that there's a God, then we also admit that there's a creator who has the authority to tell us how to live our lives. And we don't like that idea. So look what what it says. It says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas about what God is like, right? If I can't get rid of him, then I'll downplay him. God isn't real or God just wants to suck all the joy out of our life. Or God, man, he's got some of these outdated ideas. Or God just wants to put you in a religious straitjacket and steal all your freedom. It says this in verse 21. It says, as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. And here's the process. There is no God because I don't want to be told what to do. And so our minds just start to get foolish and darkened. And we build brick by brick by brick this, this life story, this lie, really. And uh, when it says he, they, they worship things like animals and birds and stuff, what he's saying is instead of um, lifting up God as the ultimate being in the whole entire universe, the source of all satisfaction and joy, what we did instead is we found something on creation. So we've taken away the creator. We find something in creation and it can be bad stuff. It can be good stuff. But when we make it ultimate, that's our problem. And so now because we can't go to God for that joy, that satisfaction, that that purpose, now we look to stuff, right? Maybe it's money or maybe it's wealth or maybe it's financial security. That will give me the joy and satisfaction and peace that I've been looking for. Or for others, it's people. Maybe it's this relationship or that relationship or it's him or it's her or it's maybe this group of people accepting me or, or this family member accepting me. And if I could just get that, no matter what it takes, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be content. Then I'll fill up that hole in my heart. Uh, or for other people, it's achievement. It's achieving this, this project or this political end. And once this happens, then we'll be content. Then we'll be satisfied. See? C.S. Lewis actually calls us bent. He calls us bent creatures because we, um, we inherited the sin from, our, uh, from Adam and Eve. When we're born, the moment we're born, we're kind of bent down looking at creation. There's this, there's this huge hole created in our hearts that's meant to contain 
so much joy, and satisfaction, and peace, and purpose. And God gave us that hole. You know why? So that he could fill it every single and fill it some more. And then fill it again. But because we've taken God out of the equation, we have to fill that hole ourselves. But because we're bent, we'll look every single nook and cranny in this broken earth. And the last place we look is up. So Paul says, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. That word abandon, it seems harsh, but the, the literal definition is just to open up your hand. It's to take something that you have a tight grip on and to open it up. Just let it go. So God says to every single human being, knowing their sin in our hearts, you, you want to strike out on your own? You want to try to find joy and contentment on your own? You want to do this whole life thing without me and leave me behind? Okay. You're free to do it. I'm not going to control you to that extent. right? But look at verse 24. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Like unlike Adam and Eve who hid their nakedness, some people like embrace it. Some people take sex, which is a good thing, a gift of God, but they make it an ultimate thing. But here, here's what they really did. They traded the truth about God for a lie. They traded the truth of God's story for this made up lie of a story. And look at what happens. So they worshiped, and underline this word, circle it, highlight it, bold it. They worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. So not only do they worship, not only do they take this thing or this achievement or this person and ascribe it the ultimate value, but they also begin to serve it. They begin to obey it. They begin to bow down and do whatever it is it tells them to do. See, worship always leads to serving. They become enslaved to this thing and are willing to push aside people, to throw away relationships, to do immoral things because that little idol is promised that it'll give them joy eventually, right? Romans 6, 16 says, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You see that process in your own hearts? I see it in mine. And when you begin um, viewing the world this way, you see it everywhere. The guy that works 60, 80, 100 hours. Why is he overworking when his family's falling apart and he's lost his relationship with his kids? It's because he's bought into a lie. He's bought into the story that if I have financial security or if I have enough money or if I have the approval of my boss, then I will make it. Then I'll be content and satisfied. And so he's willing to lose everything in pursuit of that one thing. Or you see the high school girl, the student on the treadmill at the gym when she shouldn't be running. She should be eating, right? She's, she's over-exercising and under-eating because, and she's literally harming her body in pursuit of this, this, this perfect female figure so that she can get affection. She can get the love that her father didn't give her. She can get acceptance in this one group, right? But here's the thing about these idols, these God substitutes. Listen, they never deliver what they promise. They always overpromise and underdeliver the satisfaction, the contentment, the purpose, the wholeness. It always stays just out of arm's reach. It's there. Like you can see it. You can almost taste it, but you can't put your hand uh, hold it, right? And so we work harder and harder, never realizing that it's a lie, that it's an illusion. The joy, the satisfaction, and wholeness that you were created for is found in God and God alone. Can anybody testify to that? I've looked in other places. It's not there. Jeremiah chapter 2 has a brutal description of this, and I've used it before, but it's where God says, my people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, turned their back on me, the fountain of living water, and they begin to dig for themselves wells, broken wells that can hold no water. And it's this ironic and horrible, desperate picture of everything that you could ever need is just overflowing in and through God. And yet, because of our bentness, because of the stories that we believe that are lies, we turn our back on that and we get down on the sand and we dig and we dig and we dig and our arms get tired and our back muscles get sore and our, our hands start bleeding and we finally just find a little teeny tiny bit of dirty water and we take a sip and we're okay for a few minutes and it's back to digging and it's back to digging and it's back to digging, right? That's the majority of a lot of our lives. Always searching Never finding. And that's the people around us as well. Tim Keller says this. 
He says, this means then that idolatry, you're taking something in the creation and making it ultimate. That idolatry, and this is strong, but I believe it, is always the reason we ever do anything wrong. Why do we ever lie or fail to love or keep promises or live unselfishly? Of course, the general answer is because we are weak and sinful, but the specific answer is always that there is something besides Jesus Christ that you feel you must have to be happy. Something more important to your heart than God. Something that is spinning out a delusional field and enslaving the heart through inordinate desires. And so, underline this, so the secret to change is always to identify the idols of the heart. You want transformation? You know what the secret is? The secret to your change and to your neighbor's change and to our change and to every single uh, change possible. It's to uncover the lie that you've been Believing. It's to reveal the story for what it is, false. And then turn to the only true story, God's story, right? And one of the kindest and most loving things that you can do for yourself and you can do for your family members and you can do for the people in your life is to reveal to them the lies that they might be believing. And not in a harsh way, all right? You're a liar. You believe stupid, fake news, right? Don't say that. No. It's not like turn or burn or repent or perish, but in a graceful way, in a patient way, like a doctor who just traces the symptoms all the way back to the root cause, to the root of the disease. In fact, we see this, this merciful, patient approach by God and by Jesus all throughout the Bibles. It's interesting. Um, Look at what God does as soon as, as Adam and Eve sin and they're hiding from him. It says this in Genesis 3.8. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you at, sinners? Is that what he says? He says, get over here and accept your punishment. You deserve death. I'm going to carry that out. No. He just says so calmly, where are you? He knows where he is, but that's such a revealing question, isn't it? Because Adam will have to look around. Oh, I'm, I'm hiding, covering my nakedness. I'm afraid of the good God that created me and loves me. Okay, something gone wrong here, right? And Adam says it. I'm hiding because we're naked and ashamed. And what does God say? Darn right you are, and you should be. No. He says, who told you that? A serpent, right? That's the foundation of the, the lie that he believes. And I love it. He just asks them questions. One of the most powerful things or ways that you can help the people in your life is just to ask them questions that might reveal what they're hoping in or what that idol is, what that false story is. Questions that help them discover, that help bring stuff to the surface that they might not have seen before. Jesus did this all the time, and I really wanted to go in-depth. I told you last week we were. I lied to you. Uh, but I thought we were going to go in-depth to Jesus' interactions with the rich young ruler. This is what he does. He exposes his idol. You're looking after money. Or to the woman at the well. It's beautiful the way Jesus handles the woman at the well. Hey, can you give me a drink? Yeah. Hey, where's your husband? I don't have one. That's right. You've had a lot of them. And the man that you're living with now is, is not your husband. And it's just this calm question after question that just reveals, hey, you're never going to be satisfied. In fact, at the end, he says, hey, you've been looking for water everywhere, but guess what? I can give you water that, that'll never run dry, right? I'm the only one that can fully satisfy you. Questions are powerful things. And I see this all the time. I can't tell you the amount of conversations I've had with people that aren't Christ followers and they just want to talk because they know I'm a pastor. Right? This happens in the neighborhoods I live in a lot. They're just kind of unsettled, and they just want some help. And it's so cool to see how God just uses questions. I just say, hey, why, why, why do you think you're unsettled? What do you think that you need right now that you don't have? Do you think if you had that, you'd be truly happy? You know someone who has it? Are they really happy? Have you always been chasing after that? You ever find yourself hurting or wronging other people in pursuit of that? You think maybe it's crazy, but some of these verses like speak into that. And uh, it's amazing how the Spirit uses just simple questions to show them the holes and the lies that they're believing and to point them to the truth. Um, our foster daughter, who we're in the process of adopting, I don't know if I've updated you guys there, um, uh, 
And uh, so that, I can't use her name and I can't show you pictures, but there will be a day. when I'm going to put a big old picture of her face up there and I'm going to tell you her name. Um, but we've had her for a long time. And about a year, year and a half ago, she started doing this thing. I think they were talking about emotions in class or something. And so once or twice a week, she'll be in the back seat in the car seat or she'll just be in the house and she'll say, Daddy. And I'll say, yes. And she'll say, are you happy? <laughs> And she'll just do it once or twice a week. And at first, like, oh, that's just a little cute little toddler thing. But the past few months, I've actually been saying, I, let me actually think about that, right? Because just because I'm a Christ follower doesn't mean that I keep my eyes on Jesus all the time. I fight to, I try to. But it's so easy to just be pulled away and allured and enticed by money or affection or, or acceptance or this, this cause or this project. And sooner rather than later, you just find yourself not one step away from Jesus, but you're 15 steps away from Jesus. And you've lost that joy. And I'm not saying you're always going to be happy when you're a Christ follower, right? The, 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 Jesus' burden is easy, but there's persecution. There's all that sort of stuff. It's not just this constant mountaintop, but you know, you've tasted the joy of the world. The joy that Jesus offers is just different. It's this settled, like, like firm contentment and joy and peace that passes understanding. You know? And just my little foster daughter gets me to to, to identify my idols just with that little question. I actually found a list of five really, really helpful questions that you could ask yourself. Maybe your light bulb's gonna go on in the next few minutes or that you could easily ask your friends and your neighbors. Here they are, you might wanna write them down. What is my greatest nightmare? What do I worry about the most? That'll reveal what you, you've made ultimate, right? What, if I failed or lost it, would make me feel that I didn't even wanna live? What about this? What do I daydream about? What is my mind, where does my mind drift when I'm free? What preoccupies me? This one's specifically for Christ followers. What, what prayer, if left unanswered, would make me seriously think about turning from God? Or the last one, what do I really deep down want or expect out of life? What would make me truly happy? And if any of those answers are not Jesus Christ, and if any of those answers isn't God, then you're chasing after something else. And it's just going to let you down. And see, the beauty of these conversations that we have with our family members or with our children or with our neighbors is that we don't just get to reveal the problem. We get to tell them a better story. <laughs> and we get to say, yeah, 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 you're chasing after that. And yeah, you've bought into a lie that it's going to fully satisfy you and you never will. But guess what? You have a loving, heavenly Father that created you and knows you from the inside out and he's been chasing after you and he wants nothing but good for you and this sin stuff, this sin was blocking his way, he took care of that as well. He sent his son to die the death that you should have died. He lived the life that you couldn't live. Now there's no barrier, there's nothing blocking the way and he stands ready with his arms wide open to welcome you into his family to just bless your socks off. <laughs> they give you joy after joy after joy after joy. And not just that, but to send a spirit inside you to transform your heart and to give you a purpose and to give you a goal. And I've had the honor of sharing that good story, countless numbers of people, and it never gets old and not one person's ever gotten mad. And God always uses it, you see. See, this might've been better to be the last week because um, this is what this whole series is about. We, we gather to eat with people or we serve people or we celebrate with people or we listen to people so that we can hear this, what's below the surface. So that ultimately we can share the story of Jesus, right? And I just believe that God wants to use you this week. I believe that God wants to use you in a big way. Who in your life needs to hear that truer and better story? Talk about that around your tables. Talk about that with your family. Who in your life is chasing after the wrong things and they just don't know it yet? Who in your life could you point to Jesus, the only one that will ever satisfy? And not in a mean way, not in a judgmental way, just like one beggar telling another beggar, hey, I, I, I know where to find bread, you see. Or maybe you're here today and you logged in online and you came to one of our campuses and you're not sure how you got here. Maybe you just wanted a friend to not be mad at you, so you just came. But when you walked in, you felt that tiredness. You've been feeling that frustration. You've been feeling that emptiness. And you've tried it looking for it in money. 
and you've tried achievement, you've tried relationships, you've tried to numb yourself with drugs and alcohol, and you're no closer to that joy than when you first started. I want to offer you an opportunity to step into that joy that you're created for and to start a relationship with the one who will satisfy Jesus. So across all of our campuses in this building right now, if we could just bow our heads and close our eyes. If that's you, hey, there's no shame. I was there for years of my life. Every single person that you're sitting around has been on that search away from God. It's just the grace and mercy of Jesus that we were able to turn back towards him and step into that. So if that's you, maybe you just pray something like this. Father, I'm thirsty <laughs> and I can't find something to quench it. I'm hungry and I never feel full. I've looked in all these places and some of them I'm not very proud of. But if I just don't have anything in my hands, I come up empty handed. And so Father, I wanna ask that you would forgive me. Would you cleanse me? Would you wash me? Would you accept me? Would you forgive me? But more importantly, would you fill me? Would I get my first taste of that joy and wholeness and purpose that I was created for? And I heard that it's possible through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For all the rest of us here, when we lose our way, Father, would you bring us back? Would this just be a solid reminder? Nothing the world has to offer will satisfy. It pales in comparison to the joy and the wholeness found in you. We serve a great and mighty Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, amen and amen. Uh, and look, we absolutely celebrate that. Uh, we celebrate that God has a story, and it is one of redemption. It's one where God is seeking after us. It is one where uh, we were once a people uh, that had no hope. And he is the God of hope. Uh, so here's the challenge. Whenever you're sitting around a table, maybe with your family, maybe with friends this week, uh, ask the question, who in your life needs to hear God's story? Who needs to hear that story of hope or that story of redemption, that story of grace? And just start right there. All right. And look, if you have any questions about what that looks like in your life, we would love to connect with you. You can open up uh, the chat anytime and ask a question, or you could check out gethope.net slash next. Uh, we'd love to connect with you over there. Uh, again, Easter is right around the corner. Make sure you've reserved a ticket uh, at any of the five locations that we are meeting at. If this has been helpful for you today, if you feel encouraged, if you feel loved, if you feel known, be sure and like and subscribe. We love you guys. We will see you next week.